Welcome to Worship with Messiah Online. We are glad you were with us today. Just a couple announcements before we get into worship. On Saturday, July 20, at 7.45 p.m., we'll have a family movie night on our South Lawn. Attendance is free, and we'll be watching the movie Turbo. Also coming up, the weekends of July 26 and August 2, MFAM, our, our theater ministry, will be performing Cinderella. Tickets are available online, or if you're on site on Sunday, you can pick them up on the patio. With that, let's begin worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
pray. Holy God, from you come all of our holy desires and all good works. Give to us, your servants, the peace which the world cannot give, so that our hearts may be open to obey your commandments, so that our hearts may be open to love and serve you and our neighbors, and so that we strive to care for those in need. Give us a sense of assurance that we are safe in you, that we need not live in fear, and instead we may live in peace and quietness while sharing your love in word and in deed with the world that you love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What time is it? Last week we looked at a passage from Ezekiel dating to about 593 B.C. After Jerusalem, after Jerusalem had been conquered by Babylon the first time, but before Babylon had conquered Jerusalem for the second time, and this time they destroyed the temple. So this map gives us a view of the Babylonian Empire at its, at its strongest, at its, at its largest. Uh, back then in 593 B.C., Ezekiel prophesied against the people of Jerusalem and the leadership that had been taken to Babylon, charging that their problems are the result of the fact that, like their ancestors at Mount Sinai, they didn't worship only the true God, Yahweh, the one who had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Now today we'll go backwards about 160 years. It's sometime between six, I'm sorry, it's sometime between 760 and 750 BC. Assyria is on the rise, but is far from taking over much of the Middle East. On the other hand, the rise of Assyria is putting pressure on kingdoms to the north of Israel, which is good for both the northern and southern kingdoms. The northern kingdom is able to expand its territory, feels militarily secure, and its economy is thriving. The prophets Elijah and Elisha had prophesied against the northern kingdom in 1st and 2nd Kings, but Elisha had also prophesied that a time of prosperity would come for the northern kingdom. The time of security and prosperity was viewed as a fulfillment of Elisha's prophecy and as a sign of God's favor, perhaps because of the people's support of the official religious shrines, which were considered idolatrous by the people of the southern kingdom. While the people viewed their success as a, as a reward from God, prosperity increased Israel's religious and moral corruption. It was a time of idolatry, extravagant indulgence, luxurious living by the rich, immorality, corruption of the justice system, and oppression of the poor, all driven by greed to get as much as you could while the economy was good. Amos is a shepherd, and he's a fig grower from Tekoa, a small village in Judah, the southern kingdom, which is south of Bethlehem and Jerusalem. You can see on this map where Tekoa is located south of Jerusalem, and you can also see not very far to the north, but in the northern kingdom, uh, Gilgal and Bethel. And we'll talk about Gilgal and Bethel in a minute. But Amos is called by God to go to the northern kingdom of Israel and prophesy to the king, Jeroboam too, and also to the people of Israel. Amos appears to be the first prophet who prophesies not only to the king and the elite, the elite who work for the royal family, but he also prophesies to the people in general. Amos is one of those short books at the end of the Old Testament which are collectively referred to as the Twelve because all twelve of them could fit together on one scroll. I think these twelve books are the reason Bibles need to have an index because it's almost impossible to find them. By the way, never feel bad if you can't find a book in the Bible. Use the index. That's why the index is there, so you can find the book you're looking for. More importantly, though, the book of Amos is arguably the earliest of the Old Testament prophetic books. And he's the first prophet to focus on issues of social justice instead of worship. Now, some scholars argue that Amos gives the people of the northern kingdom a B or at least a C in worship, but he is certainly critical of the worship practices of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. For example, in Amos chapter 5, starting at verse 4, the prophet says, This is what the Lord says to Israel, Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. 
For Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them and Bethel will have no one to quench it. Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba were all places of worship and probably places of idolatry where the worship of God was abused. You can see Bethel and Gilgal on this map that's up right now. Beersheba is on the south end of the southern kingdom. Amos isn't critical of only the northern kingdom, though. He's also critical of the southern kingdom, including the, the worship practices at Beersheba. The name Bethel, and you can see Bethel on the map, means house of God. And Bethel was the primary place of worship in the northern kingdom, where the king, his officials, and other elites would gather for worship. Much of Amos's ministry appears to occur at Bethel, which would have been viewed as an illegitimate competitor to Jerusalem by Amos, who was a resident of the southern kingdom. Amos doesn't give either the northern or southern kingdoms a pass on their worship practices, but his focus is on treatment or mistreatment of the poor. For example, in Amos chapter 2, beginning at verse 6, he prophesies, this is what the Lord, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, Moses had said that there should be no poor people in Israel because of the way God would richly bless the nation. But he goes on in that same chapter to say, well, yes, there will always be poor people in the land, just as Jesus in John says the poor will be with you always. And Moses says that because there will always be poor people in the land, God's people should give generously to the poor without a grudging heart, not being tight-fisted or hard-hearted. You know, even in the best, the best societies under the most enlightened laws, the uncertainties of life will result in some people becoming poor or perhaps growing up in a family that lives in poverty or without any significant resources and simply not being able to climb out of that hole. The Lord commands that generosity and kindness are to, are to be extended to those people. Exodus chapter 23 verse 6 commands that poor people are to have equal access to justice. The Old Testament often refers to orphans, widows, and aliens as those who are the poorest of the poor, the people who have the fewest resources and least access to justice or the ability to, to defend themselves. Just one of the many examples is Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, which says, The Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. But just in case you think this care for the poor and the oppressed is only an Old Testament concern, listen to this passage from Luke chapter 4, beginning at the 17th verse. Jesus stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Back to Amos. There's Amos chapter 4 starting at verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. The time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. Upper class women are clearly being called out here. Now, whether being compared to the cows of Bashan was intended as an insult or maybe as some sort of ironic flattery is really unclear. 
But the next line is a clear reference to the coming judgment at the hands of the Assyrians, who brutally led prisoners of war and captives away with a rope fastened to a hook that pierced the captive's nose or lower lips. Amos contains more passages referring to oppression of the poor and coming judgment in which God would take away from the rich their prized possessions acquired through wrongful gain. Their prosperity would be turned to grief. In verse 5 of chapter 5, verse 14, the Lord calls for repentance, calls for, calls for the people to seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. In the Old Testament, there's a concept called the day of the Lord, which referred to any time that God acted decisively in human history to bring judgment in a way that serves God's values, perhaps only by letting, only by letting people face the consequences of their actions. Now, we tend to think in terms of a one-time cosmic judgment day at the end of history, but the people of ancient Israel, including many first century Jews, were physicalists who thought in terms of God acting inside human history. So, for example, the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians would have been considered the day of the Lord. The fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians would have been considered the day of the Lord. The Babylonians being conquered by the Persians would have been considered the day of the Lord. And the Roman Empire destroying the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD, all of these would have been considered the day of the Lord, a day where God acted decisively in human history in one way or another. Amos appears to be the earliest writer to use this term, the day of the Lord, but it must have been in use in the northern kingdom at the time of his ministry. Listen to Amos 5, starting at verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? pitch dark without a day of brightness. Amos asks, why do you want the day of the Lord? Do you think it will be good for you? You think God is on your side and will vindicate you against your enemies? But you may be badly mistaken and be on the wrong side of God's judgment. That's really a good warning for us all. Which brings us to Amos' vision in verse 7, or in chapter 7, beginning at verse 7. When I started working on this message, Amos chapter 7 was actually going to be the preaching text. And now I am finally getting to it. This is what the Lord showed me, says the prophet. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line against my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. This is one of several visions that are included toward the end of the book of Amos. They seem to be precursors to the style that later developed into apocalyptic literature, like what you read in Ezekiel, Daniel, or Revelation, for example. In this vision from Amos chapter 7, the Lord compares Israel to a wall that was built true to plumb, essentially meaning that it's straight, like using a chalk line in painting to make sure to get a straight line. But the comparison is not good because Israel is not true to plumb. 
Israel is not in line with God's love, with God's justice, with God's mercy, with God's concern for the poor and the oppressed. Instead, Israel is crooked, corrupt, unjust, and unrighteous. Israel faces Israel faces harsher judgment for their social and economic sins than any other nations in the ancient Near East, precisely because of their covenantal relationship with Yahweh. Yahweh even provides prophets to help keep the people in line, but without success. The people and their ruling elite have not lived up to their obligations under the covenant they made with God at Mount Sinai. In this vision, the Lord promises not to pass by or not to pass over the sins of the nation of Israel. God will pardon them no more. The Lord will no longer overlook the people's overlooking of God, God's values, and God's judgment. The effect of God's not overlooking and pardoning their failures will be the destruction of the northern kingdom's worship sites and the complete end of its government at the hands of the Assyrian Empire. This comes to pass roughly 30 years after the end of Amos' ministry to the northern kingdom. And the same kinds of failings would bring about the fall of Jerusalem 130 years later. Last week we looked at the prophet Ezekiel. This week, Amos. Between the two of them, they, they forcefully point out the two great sins of Israel, not worshiping only the true God who brought them out of Egypt and not caring for the poor and the oppressed. Now, in our society today, we seem to often focus on issues of race, gender, or education. But the biggest issue, perhaps, perhaps the biggest gap in our society might be wealth and access to resources. According to a U.S. Federal Reserve study in 2019, the bottom 50% of U.S. households own just 1.5% of the country's wealth, meaning that the top 50%, meaning mostly people who owned real estate or had money invested in the stock market, owned 98.5% of our country's wealth. And a, a 2023 study found that the top 1% hold over 25% of the wealth in the United States. People without wealth, without a cushion, necessarily living paycheck to paycheck, may be only one or two weeks away from financial disaster. And many, although not all, many of these folks have been falling behind over the last few years. On the other hand, if you own real estate or have money in the market, oddly enough, you may well be better off today than you were a few years ago, despite years of high inflation. Inflation may have you feeling cash-strapped, but you might, if you just look at your statements from your mutual funds, you might find that you're actually better off than you were because the value of your assets has gone up. From the end of World War II through the late 60s, we did a good job as a, as a society of providing ways for people near the bottom economically to raise themselves up. We saw tremendous progress in bringing up the bottom. But over the last 40 or maybe 45 years, though, the rich have gotten richer, and the middle class, the poor, including the working poor who rely solely on hourly wages, have barely kept up or slid further behind. Amos offered the people and the king a chance to repent, to care for the poor and the oppressed, and they refused. God, through all of that, continued to be with the people of Israel, who even at this point in Amos chapter 7, God calls my people. We should be aware of God's intimate and persistent presence with us. At the same time that we examine our willingness or our unwillingness to live lives that reflect God's love and mercy, especially for those who do not have adequate resources. 
God called Amos to address issues of injustice. Amos called, called the people of Israel to repent and repair the injustices in their land. What do we learn from this prophet? And how is God calling us to address injustice in our land? Amen. Now, I invite you to join me as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we come to our, our love moment. Uh, our vacation Bible school starts tomorrow with 225 kids on campus and over 100 folks who are giving their time, giving their time to support this ministry. I want to thank you for all the donations you've given and for those of you who have signed up to be on campus during this week. Next Sunday, July 21, will be VBS Sunday at our 1015 service. We'll have our traditional service at 8.30, but at 10.15, our VBS participants will actually be leading the service. We invite you to come worship with us next Sunday. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, we read, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. When we realize that everything really belongs to the Lord, we're less likely to hoard or be stingy with our wealth and more likely to give generously to those in need, trusting that God will continue to provide for us. I want to thank you for all of your gifts of your time, talent, and treasure to Messiah. As always, you can give in a wide variety of ways. Thank you again for all you do to help us change lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now please join me in prayer. Lord, the people of this land have received gifts of material abundance beyond whatever our ancestors could have known or even imagined. Help us to live our lives focused on you so that we are not so occupied with material things that we forget spiritual gifts and risk gaining the whole world but losing our souls. Our, our table is richly furnished. Our cup overflows. We live in safety and security. Teach us to set our hearts on you and not on material blessings. Keep us from being captivated by prosperity and grant us the wisdom to use your blessings to your glory and in service of all humanity so that all may have adequate resources and experience your love through our actions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let's join in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let's sing our sending song.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.